Well, welcome to our international panel. Uh, my name is Nancy Victory. I'm a partner with Wiley, Ryan and Fielding here in Washington, D.C. Certainly a pleasure to be here today to talk about uh, the international aspects of Internet issues. And I'm so pleased to be joined today by a very distinguished group of expert panelists. Let me introduce them for you quickly, and then I'm going to turn to each one of them and ask them to say a few words about their responsibilities and uh, the way that they're involved in Internet issues. Uh, first, to my immediate left, let me introduce the Honorable Ian Stewart, who's a member of the UK Parliament. To his left is the Honorable Ian Taylor, a member of the UK Parliament and formerly the British Minister of Science and Technology. To his left is the Honorable Derek Wyatt, a member of the UK Parliament and Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Internet Group. And finally, on the end, my friend Ambassador David Gross, who's the U.S. Coordinator for International Communications and Information Policy at the United States State Department. If I could turn first to Derek Wyatt and ask him to introduce our friends from the U.K. and perhaps uh, say a little bit about the group and uh, his expertise and uh, what's been drawing his attention lately on Internet issues. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, can I say thank you also for inviting us here? Uh, an all-party group is what it sounds like. It's um, both House of Commons and House of Lords members, and it's cross-party, so it includes Conservatives, Liberal Democrats, and Labour members. Uh, and the committee must be uh, comprised of Liberal Democrats, uh, Conservatives, and Labour. That's part of the rules of the House. We act like a Senate hearing, the all-party group, and so we're all, all, not always, but mostly we are taking evidence on, on subjects that are dear to our hearts or, or more often dear to our constituents' hearts. Uh, and we started the SPAM conference running uh, in 2003. We then came here in October 2003 to try to persuade you that there were alternatives to your Can Spam Act, but uh, we're still trying on that one. Uh, and we have looked at uh, the Computer Misuse Act, which was an act passed in the early 90s when the computer was very different to what it is currently. And we'll, I'm going to put a private member's bill through the House on that shortly. Uh, last week we looked at digital rights management. We're going to also take hearings on that uh, after the general election, which we expect to be in May. We've won one national award for our work and we've just been nominated for another. So I think, I think um, the industry feels confident about the quality of our research and the quality of our reports. Thank you. Thank you. If I could turn to Ian Stewart to tell us a little bit about himself. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ian Stewart. Uh, I'm the Member of Parliament for Eccles, which is near Manchester in the northwest of England. Although, as you can tell by my accent, I'm a Scot by birth. I was keen to hear uh, Senator Ted Stevens this morning give his presentation and the excitement about the creativity of you in the US uh, I think is well deserved and I, I would just like to balance that out a little bit by saying that I know that we in the UK also uh, are quite creative. I remember distinctly when uh, James Bond picked his pen up in the 60s and said, Miss Money Penny, I'm uh, speaking to you through my pen. <laughs> so I know we can be uh, creative as well. However, the thrust of Senator uh, Stevens' presentation to you this morning, I felt was exceptionally good. He talked about identifying the issues and the solutions. He talked about speaking to you and other stakeholders before putting pen to paper, absolutely fundamental in this day and age for politicians uh, and civil servants. That pre-legislative approach is one which we are trying to encourage in the, the UK and we've gone some way along and it's been very successful in my view. We, from a UK perspective, like to see a voluntary approach by the stakeholders before we have to move to legislation. And if we do have to move to legislation, we like it to be light touch legislation and regulation. And unfortunately, we sometimes have to recognize that issues warrant regulation, but they should be relevant and appropriate. I think that 
from my own perspective, I see technology and the internet as neutral. What isn't neutral is some of the people who use the internet. And unfortunately, when we came last time, our delegation came here 15 months ago to look at the implications of spam. I suppose we were all looking at it from the point of view of being a nuisance. Well, spam has moved to being the vehicle for something that is much more serious than nuisance, both in criminal terms and increasingly potential terrorist terms. So we're here this week to look at the implications of spam from the security point of view. And my two colleagues will uh, say something about different aspects of that. My own personal interest the relevance of government um, in this process. I will say just a bit about my view of the challenges that we face in the UK. We still don't in the UK have a, um, a cross-cutting approach towards these issues. There is a, a dispersed system where different uh, departments uh, have different responsibilities and different ministers have different responsibilities. I think if we want to look at political structures, bureaucracies and strategies, we have to accept that they all rely on people. Therefore, the quality of the political decision making becomes all important. Now, I adhere to the definition of politicians uh, that Professor Bernard Crick in our country has. And he says that politicians are imperfect people trying to run imperfect systems. And if we are to make our, the quality of our decision making better, we need to have better structures, better liaison between departments, and clear decision making power resting in an identified politician. I suspect that you face the same challenges here in this country. So we can, uh, I suppose, build on the excellent relations we have. This uh, couple of days we've spent here, we've heard nothing but praise from your agencies about the relations with their counterparts in the UK. But the challenge uh, for us on both sides of the pond is to see whether we can improve that and make it more relevant and effective. But the real challenge is whether we can do that globally. That is the biggest challenge. And I want to say that our visit and this conference will go some way towards addressing these questions. Thank you very much. I can now turn to Ian Taylor. Well, you were very kind in opening your remarks, uh, describing uh, us and saying what we should uh, set out to you is our responsibilities. Well, I can, I'm happy to say that I have uh, no responsibilities. Indeed, I'm irresponsible because I'm in opposition now. Uh, my party lost power back in 1997, uh, and I was indeed the science and technology minister until then. Uh, obviously, that in internet terms it was a very long time ago and a, a lot has happened since then. We were anticipating convergence, we were anticipating the massive growth of multimedia communications, uh, that's all with us now. Uh, we were anticipating increasing broadband access uh, and in the UK now by the end of this year you'll get about 99.5% uh, coverage of broadband doesn't mean to say that everybody will switch on to it or subscribe to it, nor, nor more worryingly will they fully understand how they can use it. So the depth of usage is not 99.5% coverage, but, but certainly the coverage will be. And we were also anticipating the growth of wireless communications and the increasing ability of wireless to communicate uh, full uh, data packages. Uh, and that's now with us with uh, third generation moving ahead almost now to fourth generation wireless communications. And I think all of that has been so exciting and a lot of it has been driven too by the innovativeness of private industry in this country uh, and I like to think also in the United Kingdom as well. W one of the key issues therefore is with all the benefits that that gives and ultimately gives government through uh, e-government and in the European Union there are 450 million people uh, that are certainly being encouraged all to get online and all the governments, the 25 governments of the European Union 
have this as a goal, they like keep kicking the date out further into the future. Officially, we should be online as every government by 2010, but it, it'll slip a bit beyond that. But all of those benefits bring with them risks. And I think one of the reasons that we're here is to try to determine the element of risk assessment that's going on inside uh, the US government uh, and also to get a better feel for what's going on in, in the industry here. Uh, yesterday, Microsoft made another acquisition uh, that starts to look at worms and viruses. <clears throat> You've got very strong uh, alternative companies that are looking at various aspects of protection on the net. Uh, and I think that that industry is, is clearly going to grow because one of the sad things is that this beneficial internet ubiquity brings with it the risks which are much more, as my colleague Ian Stewart said, uh, than what might have seemed a year or two ago an irritant. You open up your email list and you get a vast number of emails you don't want to get at all. That's an irritant. But if the mechanism for spamming you is used maliciously, then it's criminal. And indeed, what we are now beginning to see is a very concerted attack uh, on uh, business and I would predict government to undermine data integrity, to uh, uh, disguise identity, uh, to uh, encourage people to commit transactions with uh, bodies that are not the body they think they're conducting the transaction with so that you get uh, false websites put up um, and uh, extortion through denial of service um, bombardment. Now all of that is, is really worrying and, and at what point is there a legislative response to it and at what point is there a technological response to it. The problem actually is that well both are likely to be used, I have to say as a, as a legislator myself it's a very slow process. So what you're doing with legislation is you're trying to frighten somebody uh, about the consequences of doing what they're doing. You're not stopping them doing it. And so uh, I really are, am interested in the way that the, uh, the government agencies are beginning to try to get into preventative action to take these people out uh, and uh, using technology in the process to do that. Uh, we're looking at that in, in Europe as well. There's some very good bilateral and European agreements uh, with the United States government, the London Action Plan, uh, with the FTC uh, taking the lead on that. Uh, Ambassador Gross is going to speak in a minute, uh, has uh, got a, a very good grip of those things uh, actively with government at the moment. So I suppose my message is, in order to preserve the benefits of this fantastic uh, uh, thing called the internet, we've got to take preventative action against those who wish to abuse it. And I'll leave you with one thought because we're in Washington. Um, many people I, I find think that this is something that they don't need to worry about too much. Think of the implications of what I've been talking about in terms of uh, phishing and the, the, the difficulties of being sure authentication of the person at the other end uh, that you're communicating with. That then leads on to corruption of data. And one of the great achievements, and it was said uh, this morning, is the ability to send medical records around the, uh, around the world, certainly around the United States, for example. Uh, if uh, those are attacked and the integrity of the data is um, in any way damaged, uh, then you have a real problem. Uh, and that could be a criminal activity that is designed behind that. I have not used the word terrorist. I believe that the threat we have is from organized crime. The terrorists will then feed off the organized criminals. So I think we've got to be ready for it, and there's no point in pretending that all the benefits of it are going to be safeguarded without trying to take preventative action against the risks. Thank you very much. If I could turn now to David Gross. Uh, David, I think that uh, probably no. most folks in the audience Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say um, two things. Okay. One, one is on broadband, which Ian's touched on, is that fine, it passes people's doors. But if the poor don't pick it up, the poor are disenfranchised yet again. And so what is the role of the state in enabling the broadband? And that's something that we are struggling with at the moment. 
in the sense that when we moved from black and white television to color television, we were the fastest to move in the world because we rented our TV sets. For some reason, there are no rental shops for computers. And possibly this needs state intervention on our side. We, are, we, are, we have a group inside number 10, which I'm a member of, and we are looking at how we can actually get the broadband connected. That, that is a sort of public service duty, a utility that we have with water and gas and, and so on. Do we have that same responsibility for broadband? I'll just put that out for discussion later. But I, I principally wanted just to ask you where, you where you think we are going in terms of our relationships with one another. Um, in the 1840s, when we created um, postage stamps for letters, uh, eventually two countries and then seven countries and 11 countries and 15 countries, and eventually 30 and then 100 and then 200, created the Interpost International Postal Union. If you trace back the same with radio, with Marconi, two and then five and then eight and then 15, we start and eventually we have what's now is the International Telecommunications Union. So do we, do we need, at the moment there's a memorandum of understanding between our government and your government in three areas of telco policy, one specifically on spam. There's also a, another treaty with Australia and America and um, Britain. And it, it seems to me that MOUs are starting. There's one between South Korea and Australia on telecommunication and spam. So if we were to come back in 15 months' time, would there be 100 of these? Would they be between different countries or with the EU or whatever? Is the inevitability, therefore, of these MOUs a new type of union for the world? Or is it a, a treaty? Or is it, what is it? So what are we going to do in order to share best practice, to share protocols, to share cybercrime information? I, I just leave that out for discussion. Thank you. David. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and welcome to everybody. I thought I'd just touch on a few points. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the issues that were raised by my colleagues uh, are the source, as you all know, of ongoing discussions. In fact, there were some of the things we talked about yesterday. Uh, that process itself, that is the discussion aspects of the process, are extraordinarily helpful uh, and always very interesting. Uh, Secretary Rice, uh, my new boss at the State Department, has a particularly keen both interest and knowledge about these things, in part because of her background as provost at Stanford, and as she will quickly mention, anybody coming out of Silicon Valley, of course, is keenly interested and aware about these types of issues and the transformational power of technology as well as some of the more difficult aspects of the use of technology. So although we all knew for the past four years about uh, Secretary Powell's uh, strong interest and desire and even familial relationships with people involved in these issues, uh, I'm pleased to say that Secretary Rice uh, uh, has a very strong interest in this area as well. A number of the things that we're focusing on uh, are, and some of the things that we were talking about over the past day or so, is trying to have both a better understanding of the issues, not just in terms of the technical aspects, which is the source of much of our discussions, of course, domestically and otherwise, but also to try to have a better understanding of what some of the dynamics are internationally, uh, and in particular the effect it has with regard to po uh, foreign policy-related issues and issues between and amongst nations. Uh, one of the things that is most exciting for, I think, all of us is that uh, where once upon a time the issue of telephony and technology was very much a side issue with regard to international policy, today that's not the case. Today these issues are first and, and right in the forefront of many of the matters that are discussed internationally and the, in many view ways viewed as the key to the future. Part of that is discussed in our bilateral meetings, whether or not it's uh, between us and the UK or us and the EU. Similarly, the G8 uh, is an active forum for many of these discussions. And of course, in the UN context, whether it's in the International Telecommunications Union or most recently with regard to the World Summit on the Information Society. As you may recall, the first phase of that UN Heads of State Summit, which by the way, was, as I'm told, the largest 
UN heads of state summit ever held when it was held in Geneva in 2003, which gives you some idea of the importance that the world, particularly the developing world, looks to in terms of these technologies and these issues. Uh, but also with regard to our upcoming phase two uh, of that summit, which will be held in Tunisia in November of this year, we were looking to try to understand better many of these issues. SPAM, for example, was mentioned, although it was not singled out, but it was mentioned uh, in the first phase of the summit. I anticipate that it will get much more focus in the second phase, in part because uh, we will be grappling with the issue of Internet governance in the second phase. As many of you know, there is a working group on Internet governance that the Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, has created that is busily working and should have its report out for the world sometime this summer, presumably in July. And then that report will be used as part of the preparatory process for the World Summit. So many of the issues that we have been discussing bilaterally and, and together are issues that, of course, are of acute and important, if not profound, interest to the rest of the world. And I would importantly emphasize, particularly in the developing world, issues such as spam, which are very important for us, are equally important in the developing world. But similarly, the transformational power of the technology is of particular interest in the developing world because they view that as a path to their future. Thank you. Thank you. And we've been joined by our last panelist, the Honorable Erica Mann, who is a member of the EU Parliament, where she is a member of the Committee on International Trade. And if I could turn to Erica for a few opening remarks. Thank you so much. Maybe I give you some kind of background information, what we are observing in the moment in the European Union, talking about the issue uh, of today. Um, I mean, maybe you should keep in mind that there's a new commission which is in place in the European uh, Union, which is quite, quite important for you to know. So the new commissioner is uh, Vivian Redding, and she took over a diff completely different portfolio. Um, and she will cover in the, in the future uh, both telecommunication policy, internet policy, and media policy. And she was working, because uh, she was commissioner before in the field of um, the media policy in the past, which is something different, of course, if you join the two different portfolios. Um, this is the first thing. The second, which you should keep in mind um, looking at the European Union, is that, of course, it's a complete new parliament. Seventy percent, seven zeros of the members are new members. Um, and uh, especially in the field, we are talking about quite uh, many members are new. Um, there's still some around, uh, you know, which are working in the parliament since many, many years on internet-related issues, but still, it's a big shift. Plus, of course, don't forget uh, 10 new member states, um, 10 new different cultures, 10 uh, way, you know, different ways of looking and observing um, the issue, 10 different ways you know, of regulatory policies. So there's a quite big shift. Now, what does this mean if you look at the year 2005? Because the year 2005, it's a very critical year. Uh, first of all, of course, there's this big overarching goal in the European Union, which we set out and which was confirmed uh, just a few days ago by Barroso, by the new Commission um, the President, um, that the European Union wants, definitely wants to make sure that it's one of the global leading powers in economic terms uh, in the world. This is the so-called Lisbon Agenda. And then if you look into the details of the so-called Lisbon Agenda, you will find that, of course, everything which is related to IST it's, will play one of the major roles. Um, so there are a lot of support uh, will come, actually, for information, um, 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 information and uh, telecommunication um, and, and uh, media issues in, in general terms. Now, if you then look down and uh, observe what is in more, in more detail on our agenda, um, you will find some items which I just listened to, which, of course, uh, we will follow as well and which are very critical for us. So the first certainly will be the, um, the question, how can we steer the process until November in Tunis? Uh, how can we make sure that uh, there will be an open and uh, democratic and transparent, accountable Internet policy accepted worldwide? This is definitely the number one. How can we make sure on the other side that the developing world doesn't feel included without you know, committing ourselves now to big funds or you know, to big... Uh, whatever kind of policy which we are uh, pretty sure which we will be not capable of delivering. So what is the way of making sure that there will be an open and transparent Internet in the future accepted by all countries uh, worldwide? And this is 
definitely a difficult um, task. And on the other side, making sure that the developing uh, world can uh, participate fully and that, you know, where there is still a huge gap for some countries in, in access to the Internet or in making sure that people do understand the technology or that the training and capabilities facilities are there. I mean, everything which follows with uh, the, such kind of policy that we can make sure that from the European side and the United States, we are working on the same goals. This is probably the most important, to make sure that we work uh, on the same goals so we are not divided, because if the two of us will be divided on this item, we will have a very, very critical year of delivering something relevant. Um, that's the first thing. Then, of course, on, on um, more detail on the telecom, um, I mean, there was last, uh, the year 2000, don't get me wrong, so don't quote me on this. It was either 2003 or 2004. Uh, there was a new telecommunication packet um, out, uh, so which was an update on the old existing one completely. Uh, we reviewed, you know, the, the difficulties uh, which were, um, uh, you know, which were still there. And the biggest problem for us still is not that the European Union actually is not delivering enough, so the regulation is tight and it's well done and it's implemented well. The problem are, of course, the implementation in member states. So the problems we are facing in the European Union and, of course, everyone else is facing with us is that the implementation is not, not done simultaneously um, and it varies. So you will find, finally, that some member states do implement the regulation, uh, regulation which comes from Brussels in a different way, which is not very comfortable and it shouldn't be like this. But anyhow, that's the case. Um, and um, something which is important, and you debated um, on security. Now, we do know that security is the, the most critical item uh, for now and in the future. So what we did, um, we, um, we created an agency which will be um, the so-called ENISA which will be responsible in the future um, of, you know, uh, being a kind of um, agency responsible and making sure that the implementation security issues and everything else uh, will be accepted on a very high standard in all uh, member states. It's, in the, it's a very fresh institution, very young, so don't expect too much um, what the institution and the agency can deliver for the year 2005. And, uh, but we do hope, and the Parliament is very much behind it, to make sure that it will be an efficient um, agency and it will really uh, deliver uh, its goals. But don't expect too much, um, I must say, for this year. Uh, the big issue, the big political issues we are debating um, at the Parliament right now, um, just to mention two, one is on broadband. On broadband, we have uh, pictures which are, I mean, just stunning. I mean, we do have some countries which nearly cover 100% of customers, like Belgium, and we do have other countries, you know, where you, um, I mean, really have uh, difficulties in finding, you know, broadband access at all. So the picture varies from country to country. Now, what we want to make sure that in, with our uh, goal of becoming a very important and relevant uh, economic power worldwide to make sure that uh, broadband policy is implemented in all member states and uh, not just implemented, but it's really delivering very fast. Um, I mean, if you looked uh, at the figures uh, which are frightening, I mean, from Korea, or, I mean, Japan, you know what we are talking about. I mean, the gap is just immense and it's huge. The gap is not so much between, uh, between us in this case, but it's between Asia. So, uh, and I think we should be clear what we want to achieve and we want to commit uh, ourselves uh, fast, so to delivering something fast, definitely this year, 2005. Um, the even more critical item and issue is on uh, how far uh, should we go and what kind of model should we develop uh, in patenting uh, software. This is what is dividing the whole of the House in the European, uh, the European Parliament. Um, you, I mean, it's just uh, such a critical and, and uh, a debate um, and we are completely divided. Um, and the division goes, you know, through all different political groups. Uh, the big question is, um, you know, we would love to have a, a system which is um, one which is not uh, completely following the U.S. model, but we still not 100% clear, you know, what should, uh, how the European model should look like. It's, the proposal is out from the Commission. First reading was done in the European Parliament, but there's so much uncertainty about it uh, that we're still not clear if we will go directly into the second reading 
or if we may even repeat the first reading, which we have never done before. So it would be a kind of test case and uh, we're not completely clear about the process. But this just shows you how critical it is and um, I, I can't promise anything on this item. Now, uh, maybe just to, con uh, to conclude on this, um, we had a, a great meeting um, uh, in the Parliament. I'm chairing the European Internet Foundation since many years. And um, we had great meetings in this year in the beginning, uh, which clearly shows that there are many, many, many colleagues around which are very willing and very committed uh, in their house um, to support, you know, progressive or however you want to call it, um, internet policies and internet related policies. Um, but, um, I mean, how this will shape out, uh, one still would have to give it some time. We are looking forward to have uh, Bob Goodlatte and Rick Boucher in, the, uh, new, uh, in Strasbourg um, actually very soon. So the Internet Caucus people are traveling over. We are working uh, with the Internet Caucus since many, many years. So there's a combined effort to make sure as much as we can do to take down barriers or to make sure that at least, um, you know, there's some common understanding, some common languages on critical issues, and we will travel over in, uh, in July again, a group of colleagues from the European Parliament, we will travel over again in July to uh, Washington and maybe California to make sure that we do understand uh, each other better. That's fine. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Um, before, I want to ask one question of our panelists before we go to uh, questions from the audience. And certainly we've heard today from a number of the speakers, not just on this panel, that the Internet is kind of a different animal. For those of us who have kind of grown up in the telecommunications regulatory world, doesn't, it's, it, the Internet is a little different. And what I heard from our panelists um, today is that the international aspect uh, and the bilateral, multilateral aspects of government officials talking about Internet policies is particularly important because of the global nature of this network. And I would imagine that is particularly true on some of the critical Internet security issues and spam. But I was wondering if a couple of the panelists might address what are the things that need to be done internationally and what are the things that, that can be effectively done by countries acting unilaterally? Just to give you a thought-provoking question, if anyone wants to grab the microphone. Well, I think the first, the first thing is, is that there aren't <laughs> enough politicians talking to politicians. Uh, at um, the OECD conference on spam, there was only one, one politician present. Mm. At, the world's, at the Information Society in Geneva, there was only one politician present. No government ministers anywhere in the world. And I think until we engage our politicians and our, and our ministers in this area, it will be more difficult. Mm. I think that's, that's the one thing. That, that's why we keep coming back here. We, we want to actually understand what the politicians are thinking too. Um, and we hope that in time you'll come to us. But, mm. you know, that's how it is. I think that's, that's the principal thing. I, I th I've said this several times now, but I actually think there needs to be a new ordinance for the Internet. I think it's going through its adolescent phase. It's a bit spotty. It's beginning to grow up. It's not as anarchic as it used to be. And it's, it's time in its early you know, maturity, in its early 20s, for there to be some sort of governance that we, that we agree together. Yeah, I would, I would love to support this. I think it's absolutely true. If you don't bring the political community into this and, and make sure that, you know, they share their views and have a, an, a kind of common vision about it, it will be very difficult not to have different regulation worldwide. And, I mean, you can see this tendency already, you know. I mean, if you look into the uh, – on, on part of the regulation which is developed worldwide on Internet policy, it varies, of course. And it's very critical because, I mean, if you – have countries, you know, which still have the policy and, and controlling, uh, you know, the content on the Internet, and content which is not criminal. I mean, we're not talking about criminal content, but, you know, just, um, uh, I mean, things we love to debate and we would love to, to have on the Internet. Then, of course, it's something which is very, very critical. And this plays then back into domestic policies. It's played back onto foreign policies. It plays back into the way we see the world. And, and uh, so it is highly critical to have politicians as much as possible and engaged, and especially in developing world and countries which are, you know, I mean, let's mention China. I mean, we, we want politicians to be engaged so that they do understand uh, what the Internet is about. And it's a unique chance. It is something different. And we don't want to d disturb the characters. That's why it is important. On the other side, I think it is critical 
um, that we have a common language, a common language between Europe and the United States. Um, this, because if we don't agree, if we are you know, in disagreement, it will make things much more complicated. And this is we know from the trade field, and this is the same um, in this field we're talking about. So we should, be, uh, we should understand what we want to achieve, um, and then I think it will be much more easier to make sure that we're talking about internet governance um, and talking about you know, the process until Tunis, um, we have some common understanding about it. If we do disagree, I'm very skeptical, I must say. <laughs> I just want to add one very brief point, which is that if you take some figures, they happen to be hotmail figures, the, the worst offender by a factor of uh, 10 uh, in spamming is United States. Hmm. However, if you then ask the question of where did that originate from, I would think that a very high percentage of it did not originate initially in the United States. So the United States may well be able to get back through uh, in internet protocol identification and other I mean, to a source within the US, but actually it doesn't solve the problem because the problem is abroad. So the key thing is you've got to look at it globally, whether you like it or not. The second thing is, I, of course, I'm a politician. I think politicians should talk to each other, and we need to. We need to have frameworks. But for goodness sake, out there don't rely on the politicians to solve this problem. You've got to use technology to solve the problem. Otherwise, the problem will devastate us before the politicians have worked out which organization is going to be the most effective talking shop. Ian, would you want Okay. Uh, I think from our perspective, the first thing in terms of what needs to be done internationally is, is to listen. Uh, one of the things which we're spending a lot of time doing is listening carefully. Uh, listening carefully for a number of reasons, of course, but also to hear the different voices out there to better understand what is it that's going on so that we just don't hear an echo of our own voice. Uh, what, what I hear as I listen, and we're still listening, are different things from different parts of the world, different concerns, and try to better understand that so that we can address those issues in a way that's more, perhaps more intelligent rather than just being reactive. Uh, I think our starting place is to do no harm. Uh, now that's easy to say but often hard to really implement and uh, better understand. Uh, part of our view is that some of the issues that, we, that are most distressing we hope maybe be able to be solved technically but we certainly agree there's no guarantee of that and quite the opposite and there's a need to be uh, careful in what we do but also we need to not be too timid so as to be able to protect that which is so important for us. A lot of the, there's a tremendous number of challenges. We've talked about spam as being one of those and from the international perspective on something like spam, our concern is that like-minded countries, particularly in the developed world, can get together as we have been doing and making agreements whether they're MOUs or otherwise. But because of the international aspect at its core of the Internet, that, that may or not solve our problem in fact, is not likely to solve our problem unless we find some more universal solution. Now, saying it's a universal solution does not translate into universal law or anything like that, uh, but rather some sense that perhaps there may be a more universal technical solution or something along those lines, because I think our view is that there will always be bad actors out there and there will always be countries that are less at the forefront than others. But ultimately, one of the things that drives us is to try to remember that the uh, internet is not just about economics, as important as that is, it's extraordinarily as important as that is, particularly with regard to our dealings with the developing world, but also one of the most core value is its freedom, freedom of expression. And so part of what drives us as we try to understand better what's going on and to help form policies is to make sure that that which we do does not adversely affect the ability of people to talk to each other freely and without censorship. Uh, across national boundaries. We think this is a major driver uh, towards democracy and liberty in the world. Thank you, David. Any questions from our audience? I think we have one over here. Thank you. Uh, Sison? Uh, my name is Mark McCarthy. I'm with uh, Visa, the friendly payment card company. Um, I, I have a question on the international aspects of, uh, uh, of the Internet. Uh, I think I talked to a couple of you guys last night about uh, the Internet gambling circumstance. And, uh, in, in the United States, as many of you probably know, according to various federal and state laws, um, internet gambling is, is illegal, whereas it's just peachy as far as the United Kingdom is concerned. 
Um, and indeed, there's a disagreement about uh, whether the U.S. can make a law in that area. There's a WTO case that relates to you know, whether our laws are in violation of the various trade agreements. Um, but the, the, the essential point is not so much on Internet gambling, but on the, the kind of problem that it presents, which is that in the United States, someone who wants to engage in Internet gambling can use the Internet uh, essentially to evade local law. Uh, now, th this is not a problem that the intermediaries can fix. The ISPs can't address this problem. The payment card companies can't address this problem. It's a problem of conflict of, of different laws. Uh, and the, the, it really does call for some international discussion, cooperation among governments, uh, some way forward in, 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 in the way of aligning or uh, harmonizing uh, conflicting international laws. And I'm wondering if you've got any comments or thoughts about uh, how we might make progress in that direction. I'll give one very short answer, which you won't like. If enough people want to gamble on the internet, then the laws will have to change to allow it progressively, because you can't stop it. Uh, if it, if it is something that is so important and illegal because it went into areas like pornography, then that is an action the police will have to do just to track down people. But if it's something uh, like gambling, uh, this is the age-old conundrum. When you get an anarchic system like the Internet, it defeats some of the worst or best endeavors of lawmakers. And lawmakers better look quite quickly at how the Internet is driving because you're not going to stop this animal and it'll just move offshore or out of state boundary. Also, also, of course, the complexity of the issue that you've just posed, it's like shifting sand. Uh, it may be that uh, in Europe the criminals on the internet uh, attack the online gambling. It may be in another part of the world they attack the banking industry. So these are very complex issues, but my point earlier was that we can have differences of emphasis, but unless we raise the awareness of politicians, the people who have the power to decide how these things work and happen, then we will not make as much progress as we should do. I think also, where would you take it? Where would you take the issue? The WTO, the United Nations, would you really take it to those two bodies now? If you, you would not. So where, where, I think that's the question I'm asking you, what are we going to do then? We're going to have this more and more. Ian's absolutely right. Look what happened to music. Okay, you didn't like Napster, mm. but crumbs, you wouldn't have had iPod. I mean, and you're not going to stop that, are you? That's a totally new business that's come out by people playing with the net. That's the inevitability. Yeah, I, I think we, we need to, we should accept this because, I mean, the Internet, we always talk about it, it's global by nature. But if it's global by nature, it means it transcends, I mean, national boundaries. That's the, that's the character of the Internet. Now, I think it's very um, odd, you know, to argue that, you know, when if something is not the way they, the national regulators likes it to be, then suddenly, you know, it should be national again. I think it just doesn't work. I, I would not argue that it must be allowed in the nation state. If the nation state doesn't want it, fine, they don't have to do it. But at least they should allow people to use the internet freely and then, you know, gamble like they do now in the moment and using the possibilities which exist in the internet like they would do if they would travel. I always argued since the very beginning, internet is traveling. You transcend, you know, you go into different countries, additional, different, now there are difficulties, I mean legal difficulties, very much, and I think one should work on those, but not actually, you know, each time something goes wrong, you know, then go back and say, no, but in this case, it should be national. So uh, this is the argument. But one should work on it and see, you know, what it can do in legal terms. Another question. Yes, I'd like you to all comment on the U.S. approach to the Internet as opposed to Korea's approach, i.e., you heard the listening solutions rather than a cabinet-level approach. Uh, I truly believe that we are in, in an information age as revolutionary as the industrial age, that in the past, diminishing the National Bureau of Standards, which had clout and could provide information, uh, has been diminished to NIST. Uh, Gore, who run, ran for president 
four years ago was derided for saying that the information highway should be given the same priority as the interstate highway in the U.S. So it, with, that, with that in mind, I would like your comment on what you think of the U.S.'s approach at this time. I'll, I'll, I'll start because I'm going to repeat what I said in uh, my earlier presentation. Um, I have to openly admit that as much as I know about the U.S. approach is what I heard uh, Ted Stevens say this morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if that's it, bear in mind I keep harping on about the awareness of politicians. If your first priority is to raise your awareness of your politicians in your own country, there must also be an imperative about understanding what politicians think in other countries. That's why we're here. And if you're trying to address a global issue in a unitary uh, state uh, approach, the two things apparently don't fit. And so I'm really pleased to hear what the Senator said this morning about before any government goes into print that they listen carefully, try to raise their awareness and then their understanding and only then, with light touch, do appropriate and relevant regulation. You had, uh, under President Clinton, Ira Magazina, uh, and then you didn't have him, and he's not mm. been replaced. And the British government's done ex exactly the same. We had an ESAR, and actually, we didn't quite know what we were doing with that person, and actually, we haven't replaced him either. We've sort of narrowed down the person who is now the new ESAR. Um, and I think the fundamental problem is, is that um, in government, government is a model that's 18th century. And if you um, therefore allow the internet to be in the health department, the justice department, the, the education department, well, unfortunately, it'll, it'll get no focus. And I, I honestly think that, you know, in, in our constitution, which isn't written, we have a prime minister and then the next person, the guy who runs the treasury, the chancellor of the exchequer. And I think the next person under that should be the chancellor of the internet. I think you have to be above the department heads. I don't know what your mm. model would be, but trying to, persuade, trying to persuade our own government, I've been trying eight years, I'm a Labour man, it's very hard to get them to even consider it because most MPs came into the House <coughs> in Britain before 1992 who are now ministers and therefore didn't have internet at home, didn't have it at work, and they find it difficult to understand. And that, that's also a cultural thing and, and more difficult, but I think there is a political issue here for us. Should we go to our next question? Thank you very much for these presentations. I'm from the Bureau of National Affairs. I'm a reporter. Could you comment on two things? First, the United Nations initiatives on the World Summit on Inf the Information Society. Uh, how do you each regard these, um, particularly with an emphasis on the protection of freedom of expression and the Internet governance issues that the United Nations now is tackling? And secondly, Mr. Wyatt, you mentioned something about the state intervening to rent out uh, computer or internet access to the poor. If you could expand on that a bit, please. Well, um, let me take that last one first. Um, any government uh, doesn't like spending your money and much prefers to get the market to resolve the issue. But what happens if the market can't, can't resolve it? What are we going to do? We will have, by 2025, at least 8 million people in Britain without a computer. That's our latest research from BT that was published in November last year. Well, that's a lot of people. Now, we can either just leave it as a statistic on a table or we have to pick it up and say, that's not socially um, a good thing. Now, I don't know what we do. Now, one of the things I put to our regulator, Ofcom, was, and I borrowed it from how cable was sold here, could we give broadband away free for the first year? Mm. And could we amortize the costs over the second and third year? Well, no, we couldn't apparently, according to the regulator. Well, now, do we need to bash the regulator? Well, maybe we do. I mean, it's the discussion we're just opening with them. I'm, I'm, I didn't mean that, really, but you know what I mean. Is there a creative market solution that, that anyone out there, if you've got it, tell us, but we've got to find a creative solution that way. And, and if it's not that way, there has to be a tax position. Now, we have got a system where if you want to buy a computer, you can have it tax-free, and you have to buy it through your company. But actually, not many people have done it, which is a real disappointment. So that hasn't worked either. So we've, we've got to find, I don't have a solution at the moment, but we're asking the regulator to come back to us about whether we can actually sell broadband differently. 
It's a little bit difficult when the main, you've got a monopoly supplier more. I can't remember what the first part was, but no, no doubt my colleagues will. I think they will sum it. Well, well, summit, sorry. Right, sorry. Uh, let me uh, try to quickly address. Uh, with regard to the World Summit, uh, in the first phase, in the Geneva phase back in 2003, one of the great accomplishments of that uh, meeting was, as I'm told, for the very first time in UN history, a explicit recognition of the importance of a pluralistic media. Uh, that was extraordinarily important for us. Uh, similarly, we were able to get an explicit recognition in that document about uh, the applicability of the Universal <coughs> Declaration of Human Rights with regard to freedom of expression in that document as it applies to the Internet and otherwise. These were some of the very core things that were extraordinarily important in the first phase. In the preparatory meeting for the second phase, uh, there was a decision taken by, uh, uh, by that preparatory meeting by the world that we would not reopen the decisions of the first phase. Uh, and now making sure that we stick to that, of course, is always a complicated thing in the international community, but I was very pleased about that. With regard to internet, with regard to internet governance, that's obviously going to be probably the largest uh, issue for the second phase. Uh, I don't want to jump the gun because we have not gotten the report which will come in uh, from the working group on internet governance. But I would note that uh, the reason for that group is because we could not find uh, even common language, no less common positions in the first phase. Most notably, we could not find uh, common language to even define the term Internet governance. So we asked this uh, working group, we asked the Secretary General of the United Nations to convene a group of experts to, among other things, define the term Internet governance and then try to identify, among other things, the public policy issues which are basically the issues associated with governmental interests associated with that. Uh, we'll see how they do, and then, of course, it'll go back into the more political process associated with the uh, preparatory work for the documents for the, uh, for the second phase. Now, having said all that, I think it's important to recognize that uh, the second phase will be held in November. Uh, it is, at least to me, unclear at this time whether or not these very complicated, very important issues can be resolved in any sort of satisfactory way uh, between now and November. Uh, and so I think you all should be uh, expecting that there will be a post-World Summit process of some sort, whether it's at the ITU in terms of their next plenipotentiary meeting or other meetings. Uh, this will be an ongoing dialogue. And that's a bad thing. It just underscores the importance the world now attaches, not just the developed world, but the developing world, to all of these issues. Thank you. Let me go to our last question. I'll try to make it brief. Um, the power of the Internet is that it's based on open standards and it provides for end-to-end -end connectivity. That's really the magic that the Internet has and why it's so much more powerful and flexible than a lot of the legacy telecom networks. It's very heartening to hear several of you talk about the importance of technology solutions to the problems that you're trying to address. And uh, I, I hear from various panelists a, a real deep understanding of Internet. I, I, would, I would nominate both Mr. Taylor and Mr. Wyatt to be the, the first minister of the future in the UK. I don't know which party will be. I've got to find a government. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's, it's very important that you understand that the power of the Internet is that it has been unregulated for the most yeah. part. You mentioned the Magaziner report. I had a chance to work with Ivor Magaziner when I was at the White House. And when you read the Magaziner report, you're struck by the fact that on every page it says something that governments do. Mm -hmm. Can we help other governments move in that direction? And as we talk about Internet governance, can we realize that we should start? There's very little need for regulation. We don't talk about brochure governance. People print brochures whenever they need to. The web should be as free and as open as that. Well, we came here in uh, October 2003. I don't know whether you have any impact, but w one thing that came out of that was the first MOU. Uh, I'm looking at um, our, our team somewhere. They're going to tell me. Uh, um, but I think we've got, um, in that MOU team, 28 countries are now meeting. It, they, they met in London in November and meeting regularly. 
And I just said to them this morning, I said, wouldn't it be good when you have your next meeting, which probably will be here, take politicians as well, so that we could another about what is going on. We simply have got to keep going on this score. I'm not a great fan of what's going on in the, you know, the, the internet, the, the summit with the United Nations. I went myself. I was deeply, deeply disappointed. And I just don't want to, the, the idea that you're going to row now for years about internet governance, well, you know, spam happens every minute of the day and we just have to resolve it. So if these old institutions can't work, well, let's kick them out the way and let's, let's find a faster way of doing these things. What that is, I'm a little uncertain, but that's, that's, my, that's my feeling at the moment. I think what will be relevant for, for this year is to, to get two things maybe out um, to the public. One thing what is important to have some kind of key principles which will be accepted worldwide, like on freedom of expression, so those kind of key principles. I think what we cannot expect anymore because, I mean, if you look into the regulatory framework, I mean, there is so much regulatory issue underway in, in so many countries, on the, you know, already one can't stop the process anymore, so no regulation at all, this is not going to work. In certain fields you even need regulation. Now, what is important is this relationship, fundamental principles which should be accepted internationally. Um, and Tunis is critical, I mean, I, sh I share, you know, you, you, I, I'm not happy about the process, but we still should work with it. We shouldn't work against it. How to make sure that the principles will be accepted there as well, because it will make a difference. And then the second, what we, we should make sure to have light regulation as possible and as much as possible internet agreement on the kind of and character of regulation. And I think this will help then, you know, to make sure there's a kind of harmonized approach. Politicians, when they come together, yeah. like to regulate. Um, <laughs> the internet is, is the first known example of how ineffectual they are. Uh, because the moment you try and regulate it either on a national basis or in some other way, the internet just moves on. It's anarchic by definition. And if you can't attack it at any one particular point, which was the original ARPANET concept, then it's very uh, unlikely you can regulate it at any one point. That's not there aren't some things that should be attempted to be regulated, or at least laws to against people who abuse the freedoms the internet provides such as child pornography. There is concerted international action that once somebody has actually gone beyond visiting a site but actually to using a credit card, the earlier questioner, once that credit card number has gone in, then the criminal authorities uh, can start investigating and pursuing as Project Or has shown both here and in the, uh, in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Uh, but, but the simple fact is that we have to understand the internet is anarchic and it will be frustrating. Um, try and do too much and talk about internet governance is, is um, going to dis dis disentangle or detach the politicians from really what's going on. The, the internet will always move more quickly than politicians can. I, I don't disagree with uh, what you said in content, but perhaps by emphasis. It, that if we accept the analysis that Ian uh, has just expounded, and I do, that what happens when we get past the phase of implementing the internet in a complete free manner to allow the creativity and full potential of the facility, when we get confronted as politicians with really hard decisions, both in criminality and potential terrorism, happens, politicians make knee-jerk reactions and make legislation. And I'm much more inclined towards a, a movement towards these issues from a position of understanding. That's why I keep harping on about organization uh, and awareness raising and understanding within politicians. Can, can I just, one final point, I apologize to the chairman. I think one of the things with the internet is protect yourself. So if you don't want your children to look at certain things, then you can use technology filters to stop that happening. If, uh, uh, if a country is worried about a tax on critical national infrastructure, then be aware that the capability is there and don't 
regulate the internet so much as to protect yourselves. Uh, financial institutions, for example, are vulnerable largely because they don't apply the policies. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I, I would be quite confident that in as well, you're not absolutely confident that your internal security policies are uh, properly enforced. If you, are, if you are attacked, if your system goes down, if your critical infrastructure is uh, corrupted, then whose fault is that? Is it the internet or is it your own? Because you could have protected yourself. And final things, thank you very much for allowing three British people to come. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much to all of our panelists. Appreciate